very nice to be here with you today and it's uh, it's really nice to see so many of you are interested in HCD and control plane performance. Um, so today we're going to talk about HCD performance but in a much more general way about the performance of control planes and interactions between API servers and, and HCD. I'm, I'm Laurent Bernay, I work at Datadog. And I'm Marcel Jeumpa uh, from Isovalent. And so to get started, we're going to talk about scaling the control planes. And one of the reasons I can talk about it is because at Datadog, we run a large, numbers, a large number of very large Kubernetes clusters. To give you an idea, we have hundreds of clusters from like between uh, 1,000 to 6,000 nodes. And as you reach like thousands of nodes in a cluster, you start to find interesting challenges. And we, we started like everybody, right? We started with a very simple control plane where you have a single master. I'm sure you're all familiar with these components where you have a single node, where you have HCD, which is responsible for storing the resource in your cluster. You have the API server, which is responsible for serving the Kubernetes APIs. And then you have two core controllers, the scheduler, which is responsible for scheduling workloads and nodes, and controllers, which are running the reconcile loops and making sure that uh, the state of the cluster is what, what, what's expected. And of course, we have all the components interacting with uh, the masters. Uh, so you start with this, but of course, this is not very resilient, right? If you lose uh, the node running all these components, you lose your cluster. So the next step is usually to have multiple masters, right? So exactly the same setup, but instead of having a single master, we now have three masters running the same components. This slide is a bit misleading, though, because uh, all these components are stateless, except for HCD, because this is the data store of the cluster. So I have three HCD boxes, but it's actually an HCD cluster. And you, you can see here that all the components are stateless except HCD, which is stateful. And so it's kind of weird that it's designed this way. So a very common optimization is to actually get HCD outside of the masters. And so the next optimization is to do it this way, right? So you have an HCD cluster where you have uh, your HCD nodes, and then you have your masters when you're on API servers, controllers, and, and scheduler. There's the next thing that's interesting, which is if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you know that schedulers and controllers are actually running a single version, a single active version at any given time. So you have a leader election, and even if you have three or five schedulers or controllers, only a single one is going to be active at any given time. And so you can see how in terms of sizing your resources, this is not very efficient, right? Because you're going to run processes that won't be active and won't be consuming resources in your cluster. So the next step of optimization that you can do is to actually move controllers and scheduler outside of masters and only run two, right? So you have two, one that's active and one that's passive, so you can do failover. And then you can have as many API servers as you want. If, if you've run uh, large Kubernetes clusters, you prob you've probably been impacted by something else, which is when you have a large cluster, you can have a large spike of events. And events are a specific resource, and sometimes they will end up consuming 80, 90% of the space of your SED clusters. And of course, when this happens, this can impact the behavior of your cluster for events, and events are not really that useful. So a common optimization you can do for large clusters is to actually split dedicated etcd for events. And you end up with this setup here, where, where you have an etcd dedicated for the event resource. And so if you have a big spike of events, uh, this etcd might be slower, but the rest of the control plane is going to work fine because the other etcd is going to be behaving as, as, as normal. And now that we've seen all these components and the different optimization you can, you can do, uh, we can talk about sizing the control plane. So for HCD clusters, usually you have three or five nodes uh, because you don't, you, it makes little sense to have more because it's a quorum-based system. Uh, it's really the most efficient is really to have three for resiliency, but we prefer to run five uh, just because if you, run, if, you, if you run three and you lose one, you end up in a situation you, where you have to be extremely careful because if you lose a second node, then you host and you've lost everything. So we prefer to run five because if you run one, we can still lose another one before being in a catastrophic situation. In terms of key resources for etcd, uh, I'd say the most important resource is disk. So make sure you have very fast disk and monitor the latency of, of, of your etcd disk because this is really something that can slow down your cluster. Something that is a little less obvious is etcd also needs quite a um, significant throughput for network, right? Because when API server starts and when they fetch resources from etcd, the volume of data transfer can be significant. And so etcd nodes need fast disk and, and a fast network. Uh, 
API server can scale horizontally, and that's amazing, right? Because if you have many uh, things connecting to API servers, having more API servers will always help. Except that if your cluster gets bigger, API servers still need to cache everything in the cluster. So you will probably need to increase the amount of memory for each API server. So you can scale them horizontally, but don't forget to add more RAM as your cluster gets bigger. Um, controllers and schedulers are easier to scale because they mostly consume CPU. So just like give a quite, quite significant amount of CPU for your controllers and, and you'll be good. So of course, this only works if you run your own clusters, which we, which we do, right? But in many cases, you will be running um, clusters, uh, managed services from, from providers. And of course, they'll do all the work we, we, we mentioned here in, in, in different ways. But even if you use managed services, you can still play nice with the control plane provided by your, by your provider. So for instance, you can make sure that the number of nodes you have in your cluster remains uh, reasonable. So avoid going too, too much above like three, 4,000 if you can. The number of services can also have a significant impact on the cluster. So be careful on the more services you have. And of course, if you churn pods a lot, this is also pretty uh, intent on the cluster. Some other thing you can do uh, when you run large clusters is you can try and decrease the load on the control plane. And I gave a few examples here, um, but there are, there are many ways you can do that. So a quick example, for instance, is if you use gRPC, you probably don't need a, a normal cluster IP service in your cluster because gRPC clients can discover all the backend IP and do load balancing themselves. And if you do this, it means you don't have to run the endpoint controller reconcile loop for all these services and endpoint can have a very significant impact on the cluster because you have to reconcile every time there's a change in readiness and then you have to distribute this data back to kube proxy everywhere and this is pretty pretty heavy another thing that's been possible for quite some time but still not a default is um i, I don't know if you know but something i discovered uh it took me uh, some time to discover that when you run uh when you have a config map or a secret by default if you change the config map of the secret or a secret it's going to be updated in your pod, right? The qubit is going to actually see that the resource has changed and it's going to modify data on this for your pod and your pod can actually see that the data has changed. So it can be useful for some applications, but in most cases it's not. And so you can make your secrets and config map immutable, in which case the qubit won't be watching for them and the load on the control plane will be much lower. And finally, some controllers have their own optimizations and we're mentioning Cilium here, which has its own KV store to store endpoint information and decrease load on the cluster. And, and finally, and this is gonna be the main focus on the, on the talk today is make sure the application you run in your cluster, so your operators or your daemon sets behave nicely and will be defining uh, nicely in, in, in the talk. Okay, so we already mentioned a few of the components that are running in, um, in control plane. So we have a API server at CD and kube controller manager, scheduler, but what else is there? So first of all, like we have Kubelet. Kubelet is running on each of the nodes and it's basically running the pods, updating events, and this can actually have significant impact on the API server and at CD performance. Um, except for that Kube proxy for service load balancing, then different daemon sets, as example, either Serum agent or Datadog agent, and they are pretty powerful, but with great power comes great responsibility to, to not over overload API server. Then we also have DNS, cluster autoscaler, ingress controllers, other controllers that you might be ri running in your cluster, and of course, users with kubectl. Um, and what's really surprising is that also API servers really like to talk to themselves. So now we will be focusing on the kubectl to understand the interaction between kubectl and, and the API server. So, Let's see this simple example where you try to get the information about one specific pod. So what happens is that the kubectl actually issues one request to the API server with API server address, API version, namespace, resource type, and resource name. But what happens when you do the kubectl get pods? Well, here you can see that basically we are trying to list all the pods within the cluster. And this request has limit 500. So if you are running thousands or tens of thousands of pods, it means that the kubectl will actually perform even tens or hundreds of API calls to the control plane, which can actually have significant impact on reliability of your control plane. Another example, you might be interested in uh, 
seeing the changes that happen to those spots. So you can do the watch equals true. And again, first of all, kubectl basically lists all the pods, and then it starts the watch. And the most important part here is to see that the watch has resource version, which means that, okay, we want to observe all the changes that happen um, from the specific version that we got from the list call. Except for that, like you have probably done that before. Yeah, you basically describe the pod to see like what's going on there, right? So again, we have the get call that gets the information about pod, but then also what we have is listing the events. So as you can see here, uh, we are looking for events with specific field selectors. And please remember this example because it will be important pretty soon as we will understand how it works underneath. Another example, let's say that you are trying to delete the pod and probably you already saw that when you try to delete something in Kubernetes via uh, kubectl, then basically, first of all, it just deletes it, but then you have to wait and this waiting is again the list call followed with the watch call. So to sum up, there are multiple components that are talking to API server and also when you are uh, interacting with the Kubernetes using kubectl, then one simple kubectl command can uh, result in even tens or hundreds of API calls. So n now that we have the basics of the control plane components and that we know how the basic API works, we're going to dive into uh, specific issues that, that would illustrate what we meant by you want, we want our daemon set and console to, to, be in, to behave nicely. And this issue here is actually a real one that happened in a production cluster at Datadog. So it's actually a real incident. So in terms of how it started, I mean, user were uh, started reporting connectivity issue to a cluster, they were not able to connect. And it turns out, I mean, we looked at the metrics here and you can see that API server were not very happy with. All of them were an LC and of course, because they're an LC, they can set traffic. So we started looking at logs and, and metrics and we could see that API server were not able to reach HCD, right? So because they were not able to reach HCD, they were crashing. Not a very good place to be at. So what, what was happening with HCD? Well, it turns out, as you can see on the top graph, well, HCD were using a lot of memory and they were actually getting um killed, which is once again, not a very good place to, to be in. So what, what we knew, right? We knew that the cluster size had been the same for about for, for weeks or even months, right? So unrelated to size. Uh, we hadn't updated the control plane, so it was not related to a new version of Kubernetes. And so we figured, well, it's very, very likely related to some clients doing something uh, against our API. And so we started looking at API server metrics and in particular at the number of requests. And you can see here that during the two incidents, the number of in-flight requests is very high. Like it's typically like around 100 and during the incident it spikes above uh, 1000. And especially, and this is the graph at the bottom, you can see that we have a very big spike in, in list calls. And, and we're gonna be talking a lot about list calls because list, list calls can be very expensive for your clusters, especially large ones. So to understand why we say that list calls are expensive, uh, we have to understand how API server caching works. So API servers are basically big caches in front of HCD. I mean, they do a lot more, but this is a, a key part for what we're gonna talk about today. And so when an API server starts, it's going to list all the resources in HCD and start HCD watches to get all the updates and maintain the cache. When a client has a query against an API server, it does a catch or a list for a specific resource and it can specify a resource version, and which, which uh, Marcel gave in, in his example just before. So if you specify a resource version, if you say, I want the res this resource with resource version X, you're gonna get it if you have a more recent version in the cache, right? So if the version in the API server cache is more recent than X, you're gonna just get it. If the API server doesn't have it, uh, it's gonna wait a little because sometimes an API server can be a little behind, right? API server have to process all the changes from HCD and so sometimes you're asking for X and the API server you're asking for X doesn't have it yet. So it's gonna wait for a few seconds for its cache to be updated and if it gets the new version, uh, it's, going to, it's going to send it to the client, otherwise it's gonna throw an error. So what really matters is these two points, right? When you ask for X, you, it means give me at least X and there's a very specific case of zero, which is, well, give me whatever you have in cache. So 
What about get and list without a resource version? I don't know if you remember the example that Marcel gave before, but kubectl, when we're looking at the verbose uh, output of kubectl, we're seeing the, the, the get command, the HTTP get command. And there was no resource version in there, except for the case of the watch. So if you don't set a resource version, what happens is uh, the API server understands this as meaning, get me a quorum consistent read from etcd. So if you don't specify a resource version, you're gonna get the data from etcd. And it's important because this is a default behavior of kubectl get. So if you do a lot of kubectl get, if you have shell script doing loops, uh, doing kubectl get, it can be very intense on etcd. And also, and even more important and counterintuitive, if you use client go, the default list command for resources is also going to do a consistent read from etcd. So if you want to do a read from cache, you actually have to provide an option to the list called to say, get me resource version zero. But if you just do a list, you're gonna get a consistent list from, from etcd. So here is an illustration of what, what this means, right? If you, we get all the pods in a cluster with 30,000 pods, um, and we don't specify any resource version, we're gonna get the data from etcd, and as you can see here, it's gonna take more than four seconds in this example. However, if we set resource version to zero, it's gonna be only 1.8 seconds. And, and here we actually had to cheat a little to, to make this work because of course, given the size of the cluster, if we had a full JSON um, output, it would be a gigabyte of data, and most of the time would have been spent processing the data and sending it over the network. So we use a small trick, which is the kubectl trick, where you say, well, get me the data as table, and so you get a summarized version of the object, which is much smaller. And, and so the time here is mostly that processing time and getting the data from, from etcd. What about label filters? I mean, when you get resources, you know, you can say, like, give me all the pods from application A, and this is what the query looks like. And this is slightly faster uh, when you don't specify resource version because of course, there's less data to, to, to send to the client. However, when you, you set resource version to zero, it's almost instant because pro uh, filtering is done on the API server and then you have little data to, 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 to send. So what's very important here is when you do resource version equals nothing or if you don't set resource version, you're gonna get all the data from etcd and filtering will always happen on API server. So even if the output is only a few pods because application A is only five pods, in our example, you still need to retrieve 30,000 pods from etcd, which is pretty intense. And I don't know if you remember uh, the described example from before. If you look at the, at the get here, you can see that get events is actually not setting resource version, right? Which means the events are retrieved from etcd. Of course, the field selector is very precise because it's targeting the pod you want to, to get the events for. However, remember how filtering works, right? This means that you're gonna get all the events from this namespace from etcd into the API server and then apply filtering. So for large namespaces or for namespaces with a lot of events or both, it's going to be pretty intense on, on etcd and API servers. So of course, I mean, I mentioned a lot that filtering happens on API servers and the reason for this is the way etcd is structured in Kubernetes. So this is the way keys are organized, right? So you have the resource side, the namespace and the resource name, which means uh, you can ask etcd for a specific resource. You can ask for all the resources in the namespace or all resources uh, of a given type, but there's no other type of filtering happening. All the other types of filters are gonna be happening in API servers. And here you have three examples, right? One is get me all the pods from app A, and this means get all the pods from etcd to API server, then filter on an API server. So that's why it's slow. The second example is get me all the pods from namespace datadog from app A. And this is much faster because of course in the namespace datadog, you on, we only have a thousand pods and not 30,000. And the last one is the same one, but get me this with resource version zero, which means like get me this from, from your cache. And this is much, much faster because of course filtering is done in the memory of the API far more efficient. So yeah, um, whenever you write an operator or a controller, uh, think about using an informer because it's going to be much more efficient. So in, in, in summary, uh, remember something we wanted you to remember is list call go to etcd by default and can have a huge impact. Even if you have um, filters that will filter the data a lot and return a small amount of data, you might still get everything from etcd and that's very expensive and use informer as, as much as you can. So let's get back to our, to our, to our incident. So we know that the problem was coming from list calls, right? Uh, because we saw the number of requests with list calls. And the next step was to understand which application was making these list calls. And on, on our cluster, we, we, we use audit logs extensively to know what's happening in the cluster. 
And all these logs are very helpful because they can give you uh, an idea what, what's happening in your cluster. You can see all the queries, but you can also see the query time. So this view here is the aggregated query time the user for the list call. And we can see that we have a single user accounting for two more, two more two or more days of processing every uh, above 20 minutes. That's a lot of processing, right? And the reason it's more than 20 minutes is because, of course, you have multiple Go routines in an API server and multiple API servers. And so if you aggregate all the queries, it can, it can be a lot more than 20 minutes. And this is another uh, aggregation. And here we can see that over a week, uh, we have a single service account responsible for almost three days of processing. And that's, that's, that's a lot. And service account is called node group controller. So, what, what is it? So we actually have an INAS controller to manage pools of node at Datadog. So teams can create a CRD saying, I want a pool of node of these shapes. And the controller is going to create an auto-scaling group or a managed instance group if it's on Google and, and, and manage it, right? And we had been using this extensively for, 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 for two years at the time and it was working perfectly. What had happened though, is we had an, we had an incident the week before or the few weeks before where someone had deleted another group by mistake and you completely deleted the workload because, of course, when the node group is deleted, the controller is going to remove all the nodes. And so we were like, well, we can very easily protect for this by, prevent, by not allowing deletes if pods are running on nodes. So we wanted to implement deletion protection, right? That seems simple enough. Well, let's look at how it works. So it's actually a very naive approach and a very simple one. So when the node group is deleted, the first thing you do is you list all the nodes for the node group based on labels. It turns out sort of this node group um, had like dozens or even hundreds of nodes. And this is not the big problem. The big problem is happening next on point two, right? So next we wanted to know if there were pods running on these nodes that were not daemon sets. And to know this, well, we did a very simple list all pods on the nodes. And to do this, you do a get pods and you do a filter saying, well, node X. Except if you remember how it works in etcd, this means getting all the data from etcd and then filtering for node x. So even if you have five pods for a given node, you still need to retrieve 30,000 pods from etcd on API servers and then get the five you need for this node. Except, well, because we're very efficient, we did all this in parallel. So if we had hundreds of nodes in this node group, well, we were doing hundreds of calls to etcd for pods on, on each node in parallel, which means we were doing hundreds of list pods from etcd and each one of them were retrieving 30,000 pods from etcd. As you've seen in the first graphs, etcd didn't like it that much, right? And this destroyed etcd. So what, what we learned is, well, list call can be very dangerous. I mean, the way we fixed it was actually pretty simple. We replaced this by an informer and it was just done. Um, and, and, and remember, right, uh, use, use informers whenever you can. And also, I mean, audit logs are extremely helpful because they will tell you who did what and when and give you an idea what's processing, uh, what, what's using time. And now that we've seen this incident, we'll see that it's, it's very common. We've seen this incident, but many people have seen it and we've seen it multiple times. This, this example is an interesting one, but we've seen uh, other issues. And of course, the community is aware of it and Marcel will tell us what, what he's been working on to, to address it. Okay, so Kubernetes community has been working pretty hard to address those of issues that we've seen, especially like the example that Laurent showed us. So one of the really cool features that are in 127 Kubernetes in alpha currently is streaming lists. So what happens when you try to do the list from the API server cache? Um, basically API server is preparing the list in memory and it holds it for the whole duration of the request. So you can imagine that, you know, like if you have resource that is, let's say one gigabyte of config maps, then preparing the response for the uh, list call will be actually consuming quite a lot of memory. And in 127, we have the streaming list, which basically you can think of as kind of like watch where we stream the data back to the client without necessarily having all the response in the, in the memory of the API server uh, cache. So let, let's see the example. So how it worked before. Again, like let's say we have one gigabyte of config maps and uh, one instance of API server. And with eight informers, you can see that the memory usage of API server was even like nine gigabytes, just eight informers trying to list one gigabyte of config maps, which is quite a lot. But then like with 16 informers, it actually oomed and killed the API server. 
with streaming lists, what happens is that you can run even thousand informers which consume only like 11 gigabytes of memory of the API server. So it's 100x improvement because of the streaming list, basically, and memory usage of the API server. So what else? What else is there? So the priority and fairness. Uh, we saw that there are multiple reasons why the control plane can be overwhelmed. And priority and fairness has been worked on like quite, quite extensively for like a couple of, like I think like two years. And it was, um, in, it, it is in beta since 120. And the main goal is to protect the API server from being overloaded. And the idea is that you limit amount of um, requests that can be executed concurrently. Uh, but then again, like you split those concurrencies into different priority levels and within priority level you can still have multiple different users who try to uh, execute calls um, and as the name suggests it's also fairness so the concurrency shares are distributed across different users in a fair way um, so let's take a look at the example how it works so let's say that we have request that comes to the api server and we have a bunch of flow schemas. Flow schema basically describes that which kind of requests should go to which priority levels. So it's kind of like classifying them. Um, and let's say it goes, it checks for the flow schema number one, but it doesn't match. Then it checks flow schema number two. And let's say that this request matches the flow schema number two. So flow schema basically points to one of the priority levels that you have in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, in this case, let's say it was priority level workload high. So we know that the new request goes to the priority level workload high. But what happens next? So one priority level actually contains set of queues. Let's say that in this example, we have three different queues and there are actually only two users that are using this priority level. Um, let's call them A and B. And each user has fixed amount of queues that are assigned to, to this particular user. So A is assigned to queues number one and two and uh, user B is assigned to queues uh, Q1 and Q3. So when we have this new request from user B, it checks for how much work is in the queues that are assigned to, to this particular user. So in this case, Q1 and Q3. So we have two, two requests that are waiting to, to be executed in the Q1 and only one request in Q3. So Priority and Fairness decides to, to put this request in the Q3. Um, as I mentioned before, um, requests can have basically different impact on API server and at CD as well. So priority and fairness takes that into account and um, one request can have different concurrency weight. Um, simple get gets just one uh, concurrency weight, but if you try to list something and you have thousands of pods or config maps, whatever, then the weight of the concurrency assigned to this particular request can grow up to 10. Similarly, we haven't mentioned much about mutating requests, but how they work is that, you know, you change something and it's simple operation from etcd point of view. But then afterwards, what happens is that all the watchers that are interested and watching for the changes need to get the event that it was changed. So the more watchers you have watching for a particular resource, the more expensive it becomes. So priority and fairness takes that into account. And when you are doing the muta mutation of some of the resource, um, again, it checks how many watchers there are and can assign different weight to the request based on that. So what's the default configuration of um, priority and fairness? So there are six uh, priority levels. Uh, by default, uh, there is exempt, which basically bypasses the whole mechanism. Then we have the system, which is meant only for the kubelets. Leader election, only used for leader election of the core components like kube controller manager, scheduler, or different kube system service accounts that use leader election. Then we have workload high, which is for only kube controller manager and scheduler, workload low for all other components, including the node controller that we mentioned before, which would be using workload low in this case, and global default uh, for everything else. So if you, for example, do kube cattle, whatever, then it goes to the global default. And basically what you can think of is that you're basically competing with your coworkers for the concurrency shares uh, in global, global default. So if it doesn't work, like your request, maybe you should ask the person next to you if 
uh, if he or she is running something there. Uh, let's see the example um, priority level configuration. So let's take a look at the workload high. It has 40 concurrency shares, um, 128 queues, six hand size. So hand size is basically the amount of queues that are assigned to one particular user. Then also the queue is limited. So we don't want to have infinite amount of requests waiting in the queues. So each queue can hold up to 50, uh, 50 requests. And one more pretty cool uh, impor important um, um, feature that was implemented in 126 is um, borrowing in priority and fairness. So when one priority level does not really need those concurrency shares, it can lend, lend them to other priority levels. And in this example, workload high can lend 50% of concurrency shares to other priority levels if they need them. So let's get back to some cool examples how you can use priority and fairness in your clusters. So you can have, for example, misbehaving controller or daemon set like we had in the case that Laurel mentioned. And with priority and fairness, the cluster should still be working and it should be protected from, uh, from being overloaded. It's that it still can impact other controllers running within the same priority level um, basically throttling them. So what you can do is actually create new priority level and new flow schema that will redirect all those requests to new priority level if you want to mitigate the issue that your controller is um, basically putting load on other, basically stealing the concurrency shares from other controllers. One other use case, we mentioned that it's a good idea to split etcd into like the main etcd and the events etcd. And uh, well, sometimes you cannot do that, right? So um, with high churn of events, what you can do is create new priority level and assign all the requests, all the requests from, from related to events like creation or lists and, and basically throttle how much events are being processed. Of course, worst case, um, you will miss some events, but it's still better than losing your control plane. So conclusions, running large clusters is still challenging. There has been many improvements from the community. Defaults are not always enough. And most importantly, please avoid list calls. And if you really need to list, list from the API cache and also use informers. Thank you all for coming. And now we have some time for questions. Hi, uh, we are running on premise on bare metal, and actually we have a similar but slightly different challenge running dense clusters with lots of pods on bare metal. Did you do anything with those use cases? Could you repeat with large number of? We are running dense clusters with large numbers of pods, mainly pods. small APIs. So we have a okay. better, better part of memory, and we try to achieve 500 pods per node, but we see all kind of strange uh, things happening there. Yeah, so actually it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I think there are like two different parts of this problem, right? Like one is the control plane that we mentioned here, uh, how, how it works. But then also I could imagine that there, there might be some problems within like just the kubelet, right? And, and managing those pods. So um, I'm not sure which kind of strange behaviors you've seen, but um, it can be either a control plane or, or maybe just kubelet itself. So. And, and we have many issues with our Kubernetes clusters, but we, not, we don't have these ones because we don't have dense nodes. So at Datadog, we have a lot of nodes, but most of them are running from a few to a few dozens of pods. So we don't have the issues you're imagining. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's tough on, on CNI and, and on the Kubernetes too. Yeah, also I would add that, you know, like for large clusters, um, the Kubernetes actually recommends 30 pods per node. Like the maximum supported is 110. So with 500, you know, like, Anything can happen, basically. Uh, okay, I, hello, question here. Uh, so, assuming that we keep the limit of 120 pods per, per node, and so we still have a large cluster, and even we try to go with the best practices that, that, that you presented, uh, 
what is the bottleneck? How much can we scale a, a, a CD da database to actually m uh, keep large cl clusters, hundreds of nodes working? Yeah, so actually uh, it depends on your use case. For example, if you use services heavily, services are super, super um, expensive for control plane because you have list of endpoints uh, within the service and they need to be broadcast basically to, to all the nodes. So um, I would say that First of all, you should take a look at your workloads that you're running and understand which parts of those workloads are actually putting a heavy load on the API server. To give you an example, like some batch workloads um, can be run with even like 15,000 uh, nodes uh, if they are like super simple as compared to like serving workloads with services. Uh, second question, have you reached the limit of scaling ACTD, the, the, the database at some point? So I I'm, I'm, I'm can only talk for Datadog, and I don't think we, we have. I think the biggest issue we had at, at one point is we hit the two gigabyte limit uh, because it was the default side of etcd. But now that the limit is eight gigabytes, we've never reached it. But also we're, we're careful, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to make sure that we never get closer with more than five to 6,000 nodes and about probably 50,000 pods. Uh, and, and within this envelope, we, we've been good, right? Um, and, and, and something we also, we should have mentioned too, but it, it was hard, hard to have everything in the talk is sometimes your cluster is very stable at a very large scale and your everything is okay, but an event happens and, and then you get in a situation that's not stable anymore. And the problem is you don't have enough buffer to for the cluster to continue behaving. So even if things are running, you still make sure that you have enough buffer in terms of memory, CPU, so if there's a bad event happening, your cluster can still recover because we've been in that situation where things are all completely okay at a given size and then there's a big thing happening and you can't really recover easily from, from it. Yes, and also I would add that priority and fairness comes here pretty well that you know, like you have stable cluster and then some events happen and priority and fairness should take that into account and basically throttle, you know, let's say that you want to create 100 pods, right? And um, priority and fairness should start throttling creation of the pods, scheduling those pods, taking into account like the whole broadcasting of events and basically offload kind of the, you know, spread it across the time. Um, thank you. Uh, here. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, did you consider in the node controller thing you had to use um, owner references with uh, block owner deletion or was it kind of not a fit for your use case? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Um, it, it might be the case now that we use on a reference, right? right? So you mean when you to make you mean to make sure that we can delete nodes while pods are still running, right? I think it, it might be the case that we've done protection this way now. Yeah. At, yeah. at the time, it was I, I, the first approach was very naive because we just wanted to address the issue. But I'm sure we um, we've been I know we've been improving it a lot, and it's probably one of the approaches we, we use. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was thinking from the perspective of like if it's not. It should work that way and should work for that use case, but if it was some kind of limiting factor in product in practice, but maybe maybe you can use it. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for the session. Uh, I have one question regarding the max request in flight. Uh, parameter does it uh, affect at all your uh, your testing because I believe that uh, by default it sum up the mutating uh, the mutating request and the those normal ones yeah, yeah. so before priority in fairness this was like the only kind of like overload protection mechanism and now since the priority in fairness as you mentioned like there are summed up right and those concurrency shares are basically like the total amount of requests that can be processed within the API priority and fairness. So this is like super important to actually uh, configure it properly to understand like how many requests your control plane can can execute. Because if you set it like to million, then the priority and fairness will not, you know, kick in basically when it when it's needed. Okay, so what values uh, did you use uh, uh, to your test? I mean, uh, have you used the default ones or have you turned it 
so, so uh, I can speak from like six scalability point of view. So we, we run um, performance tests to, to ensure that there are no regressions in Kubernetes. And for that particular case, what we do is we specify 10 in-flights per one core of the API server. Cool, thank you.